Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about Decca's Pierre Monteux edition, the complete Decca recordings, which now include the complete Phillips recordings. So you get both, and that's quite handy. Now, this particular box is out of print. And normally when I do these conductor boxes or orchestra boxes or whatever boxes, I would prefer to talk about things that are still in print so as not to frustrate you all. But the fact of the matter is, first of all, there are two DECA boxes. And when I was checking, one was still available and one was not. And so I thought it made sense to distinguish between the two of them so that you know what you're getting which I think matters. And also, we get to go through some wonderful repertoire and things which you can still find singly. And some of this stuff is available on Australian Eloquence. And some of it has been kicking around and will doubtless be kicking around again. So it doesn't hurt to go through it because Monteux was a marvelous and historically important conductor. In fact, I love, love to talk about Monteux because of the fact that he was so historically significant what do I mean by that? Well, he was born in 1875, which is like, you know, way back when, more or less. And he died in, I think, 1964. I mean, he lived to be fairly old, but he lived well into the stereo era and made a whole pile of stereo recordings toward the end of his life, which means that, that we get a, a tremendous insight into what they call historical performance practice because he was there. He was such an important figure. I mean, he conducted the premieres of Petrushka and the Rite of Spring and Ravel's Daphnis and Chloe. And, and he was at the premiere of the Franck Symphony in D minor in 1888. He was 12 years old. And he played in a string quartet which performed for Brahms and got his approval. And it really, really blows my mind. I mean, totally blows my mind that we have a fabulous long playing stereo modern recordings and much of this repertoire that he premiered and yet and yet we have moronic scholars soi disant scholars who you know tell us about historical orchestral performance practice about the lack of vibrato and the sound of instruments and all of this stupid stuff you know as if as if none of this performance history existed and Monta is the locus classicus who proves all these people wrong because he was there way back in the 19th century. That's when his taste was formed. That's when his aesthetics were formed. And he carried them all the way into the 1960s when we can hear them in glorious stereo, proving just how silly so much of this you know, orchestral historical performance practice bullshit is that we've been getting. In fact, I made a spreadsheet once um, that of conductors who were born in the 19th century who lived to make stereo LPs or who lived into the LP era, not necessarily stereo, but you know, into the 50s to make recordings. And so we know, we know very, very clearly exactly what the sonority of orchestras probably was because these were, this was the golden age of conductors, dictatorial people who told these, these ensembles how to play, who formed their, their sense of, of, of timbre and balance and texture and who determined really what the sound of the modern orchestra was. And that sound came from the, 18, you know, the 1800s the late 1800s. And think about it, when Montu was born in 1875, that was only 50 years after the death of Beethoven, really less than 50 years after the death of Beethoven. And do you really think that the universe had changed all that much in those in intervening years? I don't think so. I really don't. I think orchestras simply got better, steadily better. Yes, orchestra instruments themselves evolved. They evolved to be able to play more securely, more loudly in large concert halls and whatnot. And people make too much of that, way too much of that. The basic timbral parameters of what orchestras sounded like in the 1960s were not so different from what they sounded like probably in the 1860s. And conductors like Monteux were living examples of that. But 
these period instrument folks don't discuss that, of course, because that makes their theories nonsense. <laughs> Total and complete nonsense. It's the morning exercises of the cat, so you'll have to excuse that. But anyway, um, you know, I, I, I just, I just for fun, I just want to show you who the first people were on my conductor list. Um, let's see, here they are. I have them here. Let me see. Oh my goodness, I did 52 conductors, all of whom made records. Some of whom were composer conductors. Um, you know, and if they were composers who played their own music, because that was also a useful thing and made long playing records. There were, I mean, the first five were Toscanini, who was born in 1867, Leo Blech, who was born in 1871. Not that he made long playing records, but he died in 1958. <laughs> um, Kusevitsky, who was born in 1874 and died in 1951. And then Pierre Monteux, he's number four on the list. 1874, I mean, sorry, 1875, a year after Kusevitsky, to 1964. And after that came Bruno Walter, who also made lots of stereo recordings toward the end of his life, and they've all, they've all been reissued as well. He was 1876 to 1962. It's really amazing. Then we get Tullio Serafin, Thomas Beecham, Carl Schurecht, Desiree Emil Engelbrecht, and Robert Stoltz. That's, that's the first 10. After that, Stokowski, he's number 11. So, you know, we, we, we have this wonderful legacy of conductors who grew up in the theoretically period instrument -y time who lived to make long playing records. Some of them in stereo, a lot of them in stereo. And yet this living legacy of historical performance practice goes unremarked by the theoretical scholars of historical performance practice. I just think it's marvelous. But Malta is one of the most wonderful examples of that because, because of his importance and because of you know, the works that he premiered throughout his life in Paris in his earlier days. So anyway, here's the box. It's got um, 24 CDs. It is, unfortunately, it looks out of print. But the reason I mention it, like I said, is because there's another box which is still in print and still expensive. I just looked on Amazon. It's available. It's about $145. It's this one. I'm putting up the cover, which is not complete. Decca issued it previously. Probably, I think it was one of those Italian universal things, which was, was less, <laughs> less uh, rigorous in its assemblage. So I wanted to tell you about that one. And I mean, you can get it if you have the money to spend and you desperately want it. But like I said, you're, it's missing things. I mean, it says, for example, that it features Julius Katchen. Well, Julius Katchen does the Brahms first piano concerto with Monteux, but it's not even in that box. There's some weird things going on. His, his Scheherazade is missing. There's a bunch of things that are missing in that earlier box. And so I don't recommend that you get it. I'm just telling you, unless you have absolutely no choice and you desperately need, you know, Monteux, which, you know, there, there is his discography is quite convenient because you have sort of the RCA box and you have the Deca box and that's Monteux. The rest of it's on, you know, other historical labels that were, you know, issued on things like, you know, Naxos Historical and there are various places you can find the stuff. So let's, this is one of those danger boxes. And danger boxes because they open like this, which means that as soon as you take it down off your shelf, that happens. And you're going to either, you know, break a toe or the CDs are going to go flying all over the room. But let's go through it quickly and we'll talk about what's in it and we'll see what's good and what ain't. Um, and let's see here. We have the bookie. I think we can do this. Yeah, we'll do it with the booklet. Let's talk first about his Beethoven, because that's the first thing in here. It's his complete Beethoven cycle, which includes includes the ninth on Westminster, which is a terrible performance. Let's just let's just get it straight out of the way. It's an absolutely awful performance. It's 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 sloppy and and strange sounding and definitely a blot on the conductor's career. So we'll get that out of the way right away. And let's see, we've got um, this is the rest of this was split up between the Vienna Philharmonic, the London Symphony, and there are two Eroicas because he did one with the Concertgebouw, which is a classic. But, you know, his symphonies one and two are lovely and delightful. And there are a couple overtures here, Fidelio, Egmont, and King Stefan. And then we get the Vienna Eroica with number eight. And numbers four and seven are with the LSO. And six is with, uh, is with the Vienna Philharmonic. It's one of the great sixths 
It's in my talk on great Beethoven pastoral symphonies because it has perhaps the most perfect slow movement that has ever been done. You know, Montu was was one of those conductors. He's another one who to people talk about historical performance. It was it was that romantic, self indulgent, kind of all over the place, very interventionist kind of conducting. Montu wasn't like that at all. He's another guy who puts proves that nonsense is wrong and people will say, oh well he was a harbinger of the modern conducting style. Bull <laughs> Bull there were always two styles. There was the heavily interventionist conductors who futzed around with things, and there was the more literalist conductors who were more, let's say, classical in their approach. That's the way musicians are. They probably always have been since the dawn of time. The more strictly literal and the more interventionist. And Maltu tended to be a literalist and a very, very good one. At his best, his conducting had such ease and naturalness that you're not even aware of conducting happening. You're just aware of the, the music unfolding in front of you. And, uh, you know, for that also, he's a very important figure. So we've got, let's see, numbers uh, five and six. Five is with the LSO. Now, you know, Malta was not one of the, the minor key Beethoven specialists or the odd numbered symphony specialists, except for the Eroica, which is, which is fabulous. Um, let's see, we had, then we get three and eight. Um, Alan Schubert's Unfinished. Those are both with the Concertgebouw and they're absolutely splendid performances. It's an unfinished with a first movement exposition repeat, which is unusual for that period. And again, one of the classic Eroicas out there, especially for the Funeral March, which was one of those things that, that Monto was able to just make unfold in front of your eyes magnificently. Uh, let's see, what else do we get? We get the Rosamund Overture and Entre Acts. Everyone used to do the Rosamund music. No one does it now. It's amazing, isn't it? Because it's Major Schubert. I mean, there's a lot of serious or chunky orchestral pieces in there, and they're very, very good. Uh, the Brahms Second with the Vienna Philharmonic, which is a wonderful performance. Brahms was Monta's favorite composer. He was actually most at home or preferenced the German repertoire. But of course, because he was French and we had all these German people running around doing it, he never got quite the attention that he deserved or the opportunity to record as much uh, Brahms as he wanted to. There's no Brahms cycle for him, which is a terrible, terrible shame because he played for Brahms and he knew that style like nobody, but we're very lucky to have his second symphony as an exemplar of his work with the Tragic Overture. And we get the Academic Festival Overture and the Haydn Variations. And there's, what's this? Oh, another, is that another Brahms too? Symphony number two, who's this? No, I'm sorry, what am I talking about? Um, yeah, yeah, there are two Brahms twos here. There's this one and one with the LSO that was done in 58. And this this uh, Vienna Philharmonic one was done in 57. I mean, this was when, when Phillips and Deco were competing with each other. So they had they had multiple versions of these things, which is sort of astonishing. But you get two of those. And let's see what else we have here. Uh, the first piano concerto, as I said, with Julius Katchen, which is kind of a classic. Dvorak Seventh with the LSO, a fabulous Dvorak Seventh, one of the great ones, unquestionably one of the great ones. And he doesn't mess with the orchestration as much as other people do in their performances. It's very funny at the counterstatement of the first subject, the big climax, da 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 da, that business. Most conductors, even Czech ones, add horns and or trumpets because it's very hard to hear the theme cut through, you know, the high string tremolo. It's only given to woodwinds. But if the woodwinds really play out, you can hear it. And you can hear it here. Uh, Berlioz, the complete Romeo and Juliet. That's worth having. Um, it's with Regina Resnick, Andre Terp, and David Ward. That's with the LSO and chorus. And then we get the Symphonie Fantastique with the Vienna Phil and a Midsummer Night's Dream Overture and Incidental Music, also with the Vienna Phil, wonderful Midsummer Night's Dream Overture. The Symphony Fantastique is good, but not great. It wasn't sort of in, in Monteux's wheelhouse the way it was in Munch's wheelhouse. It's not as hallucinatory and crazy, I think, as it should be, because Monteux was a, a very, a very, um, what's the word, balanced, 
conductor and to go crazy, you know, with Berlioz, you have to be kind of nuts, <laughs> um, or or at least at least you have to be willing to to go there in a way that Monzo just wasn't quite. And that's that's not a tragedy. Haydn Symphony ninety four and one hundred one with Vienna Phil, good solid big band Haydn. Um, that's what it is. It's not going to be anybody's most exciting Haydn, but it's not bad. Then we get Tchaikovsky, Sleeping Beauty excerpts and Swan Lake excerpts, which are lovely. This was actually two discs. These are with the LSO, and they were on Philips, and they're quite, quite famous. Monzo, of course, was a fabulous ballet conductor. He worked with Serge Diaghilev in doing all of those ballet russe, ballet premieres in the first decades of the 20th century, and he did it wonderfully. His performances of Tchaikovsky Symphonies 4, 5, and 6 are classics, but those are on RCA. They're in stereo with the, London, with the Boston Symphony, and they are fantastic. There is a smaller box of the Monta stereo stuff that was issued on RCA from the big Monta box, and that's, that's some, some really fabulous stuff you should try and get your hands on if you can. And then there, here's the Scheherazade with the LSO, which is another classic. And then we get Stravinsky. Ooh, Stravinsky. We get the Firebird Suite. And this is with the Paris Conservatory Orchestra. And boy, do they sound Paris Conservatory-like. This was no one's idea of what great Stravinsky playing is. It really wasn't when it came out, and it's probably still not now. But it's fun to hear the orchestra do it and survive it, especially the Petrushka which Monta recorded again with the Boston Symphony. But it's fun to hear the orchestra do it and survive it, especially the Petrushka, because Monta did a simultaneous, basically, recording with the Boston Symphony in glorious stereo with fabulous playing. And you sort of hear how it really ought to be done. Um, and there's also a Rite of Spring, which Monta had done fairly recently in mono with the Boston Symphony, which is a much better performance than this Paris Conservatory one. I mean, they could be really quite slovenly, and The Rite of Spring is not one of the pieces you want to do slovenly, but both performances are fascinating because Monta conducted the premiere. He didn't particularly care for the piece, but he became known for the piece, and so he was always asked to do it, and, and he really was very instrumental in, in actually finalizing the text, the score. If you look at his his notes to Stravinsky about how to play the Rite of Spring. I mean, he had questions, obviously, at the rehearsals and at the premiere, and he, he asked Stravinsky a lot of these questions and got Stravinsky to make adjustments, which were really quite, quite important in, you know, the sound of the work as we have it today. So he was almost a bit of a collaborator with Stravinsky in realizing the Rite of Spring, and so his performances of it are quite important. They really are. Then we get Debussy, which he did marvelously. You get the uh, prelude to the afternoon of a fawn. Two nocturnes. They didn't always do sirene in those days because you needed that women's chorus to hum along, and you didn't always have one, so you only get nuage and fete. Then you get the complete image. That's a classic, absolutely a classic version. And the music from the martyrdom of St. Sebastian which was quite a rarity in its day. That's with the LSO. Now, the LSO in the early 60s was, was you know, in a what they charitably call a rebuilding phase. It was a messy, messy orchestra. It always could be um, in that period. That's why you have, for example, the horrifying Anthony Collins Sibelius that certain psychotic people think is good Sibelius, even though the playing is wretched beyond belief. That's with the LSO. And Collins was not the kind of guy who was going to whip them into shape. Monteux did. Monteux did. He got some really fine, fine playing in some of these performances out of a, a band that was not up to it at all, in all cases. And then we get Ravel, Daphnis, and Chloe. This is a classic version. It was with the Covent Garden Orchestra and, let's see, the Rhapsody Espagnol and the Pavan. This is with the, uh, like I said, with the Chorus of Covent Garden and the LSO, pardon me. And it's a wonderful Daphnis and Chloe. I mean, again, for its pacing, for its color, for its sense of shape. I mean, Monteux is absolutely unparalleled, and he conducted the premiere, and we have one in stereo. And so people who say, well, back in 1911, you know, you had period this, and you had trombones that did that, and trumpets that sounded like that, and whole strings that played with no vibrato. And other stuff. Come on. Come on, here we have it. 
straight from the horse's mouth. If performance practice means anything, then these classic Monteur recordings have to mean something. Same thing with the Franck D minor that he did in stereo with the Chicago Symphony, one of the classic Franck D minors. And he was there at the premiere. I mean, what more, what more do we need, right? Okay, more, more Ravel, Bolero, Laval's, Mother Goose, the complete ballet. These are all classic performances. And they've been bettered, I will say. They're not my favorites. They really aren't. The Mother Goose Ballet, particularly, with the, with the LSO, it has been played far more exquisitely by later orchestras and conductors. But, but these are lovely performances. There's nothing not to really like in them. And Sibelius too, one of the great Sibelius twos, coupled with the Enigma Variations. I have always said that the best performers of the Enigma Variations were not British because they don't take it for granted and they wouldn't allow their orchestras to take it for granted. So it's one of the classic Enigma Variations. It's also true of Joachim's Enigma Variations, which is just fabulous. They're just wonderful performances. And then we have, let's see, Bach, the suite number two, and then the Gluck dance of the Blessed Spirits, and the Mozart flute concerto with his son, Claude, Claude Monteux. You know, we get Claude doing the flute stuff. And then we have another Ravel disc. This is with the Royal Philharmonic, with Bolero, Lavals, and the Pavon for a Dead Princess. That's CD 23. And that's uh, the last disc, Rehearsals. Another, some rehearsals for the Eroica, the Funeral March. Wonderful to hear how he does it. 13 minutes of that. And then, of course, some rehearsals of the ninth, which seemed to have made no difference whatsoever. <laughs> and the final miserable result and a little bit of a rehearsal of Daphnis and Chloe, and then uh, him doing the Marseillaise. And that's it. That's it, my friends. 24 Monta CDs, most of which are well worth having. Uh, he was le maître. They called him the master, the maestro. And he was indeed a maestro, a fabulous, fabulous conductor, a wonderful man, a great teacher of conducting, somebody who really... Um, I think made a mark, a huge mark on 20th century music and the way we understand orchestras should play and who doesn't get the credit for it. Um, he really doesn't. So it's a very important set by a, a tremendous conductor. This and the RCA set, which has mostly San Francisco and Boston stuff and also that Chicago Franck D minor. You know, um, all I can say is that everybody needs to get this. Maybe this will come back into print someday. Um, I'm, it pisses me off that it ever was allowed to go out of print. But then, you know, Decca shot itself in the foot by having those two boxes. And um, it's stupid. It's just stupid. But that's the way it goes. You know, it's stupid. And there's not much more we could say about it. Except keep on listening, folks. Thank you for joining me. Take care.